Okay, good day everybody. I uh, hope your school year is off to a good start and that everything is moving like a well-oiled machine. Um, today we're talking about student engagement and uh, a, a number of us faculty uh, put on a series of talks uh, last semester and the semester before uh, on what constitutes good student engagement uh, from different perspectives. My perspective is uniquely CTE, very lab intensive and uh, uh, I have some ideas that uh, I'd like to share, and uh, you'll find some uh, downloadables uh, along with this uh, brief presentation. So uh, what is student engagement? Well, from my perspective, it is students taking ownership of their educational experience. And uh, while that might sound good, um, we have to make that into something a little bit more concrete and tangible. So first and foremost, it necessitates structure. Uh, students need to know what is expected of them and to always be keenly aware of it and whether or not they are living up to it. And that means that they not only need to be reminded, but have it take a life of its own. And that's something else that sounds good and we have to make that into something tangible. So I'm gonna take a look at some things uh, where I came up with some ideas that seem to me to be very effective. So I've broken this down into four phases of student engagement and it starts on the very first day when the uh, course is being explained to the students what it is they're going to learn, what it is that's going to be expected of them. And one of the first things that you'll find uh, in the downloadables uh, to go along with this is a couple of uh, uh, small documents. One is an excerpt from uh, the syllabi that I use in all my classes. And another is a checkoff sheet that I use uh, so that students are aware of their performance in class on an ongoing basis. First, in your syllabus, the course requirements need to be clearly spelled out, and that means that they need to understand grading criteria, they need to understand uh, how the grading criteria are weighted, if that's how you grade, and uh, what the grading scale is, etc. They need to have a clear picture of policies and what is expected of them. There are some classes where students don't fully expect that attendance is mandatory. There are other classes where missing even a single day is a huge detriment. Um, my classes tend to be uh, the latter, where missing a day means you miss a lot. We tend to have long days, we tend to have a lot of content. Um, and so I've developed policies uh, with regard to absence uh, in trying to keep consistent with Citrus College policy of uh, three absences uh, means that the instructor is empowered to potentially drop the student if they think that they're going to fail as a result of that. Uh, I've developed a policy of what constitutes an absence. and so. Uh, an absence, uh, in its most basic form, is a student is not present for class. Um, in CTE areas, we have a slightly different uh, view of what constitutes an absence because we are not only uh, preparing students academically, we're also preparing them for careers and to be members of the workforce. And so we have to be uh, big on what we call soft skills. And so a student coming tardy uh, it's not unheard of for an instructor to count that as part of an absence. Uh, in our particular department, most of the instructors lock the door and the student who is tardy can come in at the first break um, and it counts as half an absence. I've developed something called the three strikes rule where a student can be considered absent if they have uh, failed to live up to a particular standard. And the standards usually apply to things like dress code. We do have a uniform policy. They apply to things like having uh, pre-work done that was expected uh, during the particular day. And uh, the reason for this primarily is not to uh, take as many steps as we can to see to it the students fail, but rather to get students' uh, own motivations uh, to help them take ownership of their educational experience. And what we mean by that is when a student is uh, shows up to class in one of my classes and they don't have their homework done, for example, They'll participate in lecture just like everyone else will, and if we have a computer lab exercise to do, they'll participate in that as well. But if we have an activity where we're going out to our physical lab, then that student is going to remain in the classroom and complete their homework while the rest of the students are moving on with their other assignments. Um, this is uh, so that they have their fundamental preparation done before they start working with equipment that could potentially hurt them, right? And so we have some things like that going on. Um, again, this is an idea trying to use the students own motivations. Most of our students when I teach in automotive technology are very motivated to go work in the shop. And so if I have a policy that they know they have to live up to, to be allowed to work in the shop, 
they tend to adhere to that policy. Second phase of student engagement is how you conduct lecture. Every one of us has probably at one time or another uh, been to some speaking engagement or another where the person did a very excellent job of reading to the audience what the PowerPoint slides say. In my opinion, and I think there's probably a number of people watching this right now that uh, would agree with me, reading what's on a PowerPoint slide is no help to anybody. You could have just given them a handout and we'll call it distance ed um, or something like that. Your PowerPoint slides probably shouldn't say much at all, but rather use images that are pertinent and some key points that are pertinent uh, to keep you on track with your lecture. Using a PowerPoint just as a uh, trigger for what you're going to say uh, is probably more effective than just saying what is on the PowerPoint slide. One of the things I like to do is use humor to keep people engaged. A little bit of nutty professor goes a long way, right? And so where possible, I'll have students participate in demonstrations in front of the class. I can think of a, a time when I had a student jump uh, across a 12 inch uh, boundary that I drew on the floor and asked him how hard was that to do? And he said, not very hard. So I extended it to 36 inches and said, do you think you can just do a standing jump 36 inches? Well, of course a student couldn't do that. And uh, we likened that to something electricity is trying to do when it jumps across a spark plug and how it makes a difference in uh, the electricity's experience if the spark plug gap is not correct. And so while that's a little bit of a, of a reach, it was still effective. And I can tell you, everybody was paying attention. You need to force students to participate, especially the ones that you can see are not engaged. And so we can all remember having been to some form of seminar or speaking engagement where the person speaking said, uh, okay, does anybody have any questions? There is no more surefire way to get a room to go quiet than to ask if anybody has any questions because they won't. Uh, when they do, they're probably the ones that were asking questions all along anyway, and those are not the ones that you have to try to engage. They were already engaged. Um, but what you need to do is ask questions of your students to see if they are understanding what you've been presenting so far and at the very least following along. <clears throat> some students will naturally kind of organically participate. Some students will be uh, less inclined to participate. So what you've got to do uh, or what I find effective is to call them out individually. Call their names and that means learn their names. Point if you don't know their names. You can say, uh, ma'am, can you say something? Sir, what do you think about this? There's uh, things like that that you can do. One of the next things I'd like to talk about since I do teach in a program that is very lab intensive is talk about the structure of the labs. First, uh, students in a program like mine are motivated to do the lab part. Uh, they like that stuff. They like the hands-on, they like being out in the shop, they like working at their own pace. But their labs need to be constructed in such a way that they have structure as well. And so I have constructed a number of labs and you'll find this downloadable, just an example, and if you want more you can always reach out to me by email. Um, but you'll find an example of both instructor and student versions of a lab uh, along with this presentation. And what these labs do is they utilize a couple of different uh, mechanisms for competency-based instruction. And so the first part is what we like to call a system basics section where the student participates in some discovery learning that refers them to their textbooks and also to some online resources including a technical information system that we use in our program uh, to find uh, information, specifications, and theoretical descriptions of the operation of systems and components uh, so that their understanding can become more robust before they start digging their hands into stuff that could potentially hurt them or hurt the vehicle they're working on. Discovery learning uh, is the first part of these labs. Practical application is the second portion, and you know, in our world, that's an on-car piece. Uh, and after we have uh, put them through some discovery learning and some practical application, we have a brief knowledge assessment at the end, which is intended to see how well they... Uh, synthesized what they just did, how well they were able to uh, comprehend what they just did, and also to prepare them for upcoming examinations. <clears throat> what I typically do, and uh, there's an example of this uh, in the downloadable section uh, along with this presentation, is I give students a checkoff sheet for their lab projects, right? So you'll find this uh, downloadable for you. You'll notice on this that I've got some yellow boxes and some white boxes. And the yellow boxes represent required assignments. The white boxes represent extra credit. 
the extra credit is only eligible to the student. The student is only eligible to earn that extra credit after they've completed the required assignments. And because we know that they are motivated uh, to do the things that are listed as extra credit, not necessarily for the extra credit, but because this is a program where they want to do a lot of hands-on stuff, um, they tend to very willingly uh, and effectively uh, manage their time and get their required assignments done. And I found that to be an effective tool. Using their motivation, once again, using their motivation, uh, the motivations that we understand them to have to help them succeed. And uh, getting their work done is a big part of getting them to succeed. So I thought of uh, something else I'd like to share with you, and that is uh, how to keep students engaged uh, when you're reviewing for a quiz or exam. And uh, one of the things that I do, uh, I created a template um, for a Jeopardy game. And there's nothing students like better than competing with other students, right? And so you can put them into small teams and run a Jeopardy game, and you'll have a, an example of this uh, included in, in uh, the area where you can download uh, some files related to this. Uh, but this Jeopardy game is really cool because it starts off with a grid with six categories that they can choose uh, answers and questions from, and we do do it in the form of a, you know, you have to answer in the form of a question. Um, but what it is, is in each, uh, on, on the main title screen, there is a, a list of categories with dollar amounts, and it's kind of hard to show you right now, so you'll have to take a look at the file. Um, but uh, each uh, dollar amount is a hyperlink that takes them to, or takes you to a specific slide in the PowerPoint where an answer is given, and then the students have to come up with a question. And uh, after the, uh, the, the reveal is given of what the correct response should have been, uh, there's an arrow that takes you back to the main screen. And then the cool thing was that I, I had used hyperlinks uh, look the same as the background color. And by doing that, uh, it makes the original uh, dollar amount disappear so that it's no longer selectable and it lets you know which ones have been used and which ones haven't. So it's kind of cool. So take a look at that PowerPoint if you get a chance. One of the things that I like to do, and uh, this idea was spawned by uh, the statewide emphasis on student learning outcomes, uh, we all assess student learning outcomes in different ways. Uh, one of the key measures in automotive technology is industry standard exams that are conducted by a third party and uh, having students complete those and uh, how effectively they are, or how well they're able to pass uh, those and what our pass rates are is a pretty good picture of our student learning outcomes. But uh, preliminary to that, what I like to do is give students quizzes and uh, you'll see an example of one quiz uh, in the downloadable section uh, that's included with this. Um, where I have an A version of a quiz and a B version of a quiz. And the idea behind that is the students will take the A version first, and when all the students have completed, we will review the A version of the quiz. And this A version has questions, typically multiple choice questions with distractors, and uh, we will review this quiz and see how everyone did. And then we'll do a B version of the same quiz, which has had all the questions and some of the answers uh, mildly reworded such that the answer changes, uh, but the idea and the concepts that were uh, being examined in the A version are the same. And the idea behind that is if a student performs better on the B version than they did on the A version, then we can identify that a change took place, and that change is uh, what we call learning. And so that's just one example of uh, something that you can do. It's uh, useful for documenting student learning outcomes, and it's actually kind of useful for getting the light to turn on in your students as well. Uh, students in a program like uh, ours uh, in automotive technology are examined on an ongoing basis all the time throughout their career. They're going to be taking written exams uh, year in, year out uh, to maintain credentials and to be able to demonstrate proficiency in ever-changing technology. And so uh, brushing them up on their test-taking skills uh, doesn't hurt either. Um, one of the things, just to take from this as a kind of a global view is that what we're really trying to do is have structure in all things, right? We're having to have, we're trying to have structure everywhere. Setting the tone during the introduction or syllabus, uh, keeping students engaged and structured during lecture, forcing participation during lecture, forcing participation during labs, and uh, using assessments that are meaningful and not only uh, tell us something about the quality of student learning, but help them prepare for uh, the world ahead.